questions. Okay, let's begin with our first session for a course response in the area of climate, environment and health in the Americas. Welcome everyone. It's a real, real pleasure to welcome you. I'm Ana Suarez Ibarra. I'm the science director at the IAI, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. I am one of the co-organizers of this course. And uh, we're going to be introducing the other organizers shortly. Remember that you can choose the language of your preference by using the interpretation uh, buttons at the bottom of the screen. There you can select English or Spanish. Also remember that these lessons will be recorded in English and Spanish, and you can review the recordings after each lesson. They will be updated, they will be uploaded to the website. First of all, I would like to introduce our organizers, and they would like to uh, share with us a few welcoming, welcoming words. First, Cecilia Sorensen, Director of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, Cecilia. Thank you so much, Dr. Stewart. My name is Cecilia Sorensen. I am the director of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education. I'm based at Columbia University in New York, and it is just such a pleasure to be here today with all of you to embark on this really exciting workshop. I think that the work that we are going to be undertaking in the next seven weeks is some of the most critical work that we need to be doing at this time as we are facing unprecedented climate change as well as planetary and environmental changes throughout the Americas and throughout the world. So I am so excited to welcome you all here. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest in this. And we will be with you throughout this journey. And I look forward to getting to know you all. Back to you, Anna. Gracias, Cecilia. Eh, Daniel Bus de la Organización. Thank you, Cecilia. Daniel Bus from the Pan American Health Organization. Please, Daniel, go ahead. Hello, good morning, Dr. Anna Stuart Ibarra, friend, and Cecilia Sorensen on behalf. Uh, uh, I would also like to. Uh, thank every colleague that has participated in preparing this course. And first of all, I would like to congratulate the projects that have been selected. The proposals have been excellent. They have been well thought out and they are relevant um, uh, in the area of TD science when it comes to supporting ministries or health or subnational health institutions, because they are priorities in this case. I believe this is a great opportunity, as Cecilia was saying. I believe this is one of the main actions that we have identified. Many times, countries and researchers really want to, you know, make proposals in order to invest money, but many times they find it difficult uh, to connect uh, research and government needs and also government commitments. And that's uh, the aim of this course, you know, to work together with the country commitments or uh, provincial commitments, city commitments, and the policies that are being implemented with, research, with relevant research in order to guide interventions also to measure how successful these interventions are. At the end of the process, we aim to have solid proposals that might be, have some initial funds through you know, this initiative or other partners that are probably participating today or you know, receiving your feedback at the end of this seven week course. We are so happy at PAHO. I work in Washington, D.C., but we have colleagues from, you know, the country teams that are participating in the course. If uh, there is interest, capacity, and if you can do this, I would suggest you try to contact our counterparties, our counterpart. Uh, contact in the countries because they, they will help you liaise your work with the Ministry of Health and other ministries in each country. At PAHO, we strongly support this initiative. And we also have, of course, the, the participation of everyone here. 
So I wish you the greatest success in this event. And I would like to give uh, the floor back to Anna for her follow-up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, every colleague for preparing this proposal. And thank you, to, thank you to everyone who has worked in the backstage preparing this interesting course. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel and Cecilia. On behalf of the IAI, I would like to also congratulate our teams. We have 26 teams from 14 countries represented here. Over 40 uh, government individuals from various sectors participating in the course. Um, this, this course is successful because of you, the participants, and also how you will be implementing the course and making the necessary changes at every scale, you know, locally, na nationally, uh, regionally, and globally. At the IAI, we promote uh, the cooperation of scientific information so that it's useful for the government and other uh, stakeholders in the region to improve decision making when it comes to facing global change. As we will hear in this week, in these weeks, TD science can contribute several tools to close the gap between science and decision making or you know action. And this goes hand in hand with science communication. This is why we have an excellent group of experts to uh, support us, to teach us uh, about these different areas. I would also like to thank the entire coordinating committee who have been working weekly for months in order to be here today. This is an excellent team, really. And you will be meeting them as we go along. I would also like to introduce our key partner, uh, Latino America 21. They will be leading uh, Thursday's sessions. Geronimo, I would like to introduce you now. Thank you, Ana. First of all, on behalf of Latino America 21, I would like to thank the invitation and of course your trust uh, because you have invited us to participate in this GCCHE course. Maybe if you don't know Latino America, I mean, you know where is uh, we are a media outlet that specializes in, in scientific and political issues in Latin America. And we have, of course, the participation of the academia. Our columnists are academicians in different areas. And with the IAI, we have covered several climate change uh, topics for some time now. Therefore, the aim of the course, the courses, uh, five courses or lessons uh, delivered by Latino America 21, experts, journalists, academicians, and experts in science communication from different uh, countries in Latin America. Our aim, or the aim of these uh, sessions, is to, you know, bring scientific knowledge closer to larger audiences, civil society, uh, organizations and decision makers as well. We have been organizing this course with the IA for a long time now. And the idea is to provide specialists and academicians with the main tools so that they can, uh, you know, um, make their knowledge known to a larger audience. And this is what Latino America 21 does. Hopefully these five sessions will be fruitful and make a contribution in this joint effort. So once again, uh, thank you for your trust and thank you for inviting us to participate in this project. Thank you, Geronimo. I would also like to introduce Carolina, Dr. Carolina Adler from the Mountain Research Inici Initiative. Carolina. Thank you, Anna. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I would also like to welcome you. It's amazing to see over 100 participants in this uh, uh, first session. I am Carolina Adler, I'm the Executive Director of the Mountain Research Initiative, which is a network that promotes research in the area of global change in the mountains. We have supported and promoted this course on our social media and our IAI partners because we believe that uh, mountain issues are also important when it comes to climate change and health. 
the impacts we have in the mountain do not just stay in the mountain. They actually, uh, these changes affect us globally. And this is why it's important to focus on this. This course actually, you know, provides this opportunity. So speaking as a lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the most recent sixth assessment, um, one of the key things that also attracted us to support this course is the fact that the IPCC, one of the key um, conclusions of the sixth assessment was the importance given to nexus topics such as health and climate. And one of the key regions in which we found um, important gaps in our knowledge to offer um, information to policymakers for climate action is in fact in, in the Latin America region. So this is also a key area that uh, this course is already uh, undertaking to bridge that gap, which is a very encouraging uh, prospect, not least in the lead up to the seventh assessment, uh, which will likely take place in a few years time. Um, so the outcomes and the outputs of this course and your projects are already very well lined up to uh, become an important part of the knowledge base that will support such assessments and global inputs at the global agenda. So my congratulations to all of you for this effort and in incredible opportunity to already embark in that journey. And with that, I would like to turn back to Anna and thank you all very much for the opportunity for MRI to also uh, share the successes um, with uh, the networks. Thank you. Gracias, Carolina. Gracias a todos. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you to all our partners and organizers. Now I would like to briefly go over the course overview. And then there's another partner that is not here, but they're also supporting us and they're UNICEF. Hopefully at some other point, they will be able to attend and introduce themselves. We have uh, three stages in this uh, course. We have phase one, uh, tutoring, virtual tutoring and training. This is a seven week course. We will be working with uh, teams and individuals from the region. Phase two, after the course, and we need to check, you know, the potential dates for the first week of February. The idea is to have an in-person training. And we will be sharing more information afterwards. And then phase three, we will have initial grants with seed grants and co-funding to implement these projects. Objective of phase one, to develop, uh, to create communication and commitment capacities with several stakeholders by focusing on the science policy interface and in the true participation of communities and output for the teams that want to go on to the next stage to develop a concept note on a TD uh, research topic. This week, week, we will be sharing more information about um, the uh, overview, the layout of this concept note so that you can, uh, along these weeks, you can work on writing these concept notes that you will be sub submitting a few weeks after this course is over. Let us now briefly go uh, through the seven weeks. Session one, week one, introduction to TV approaches. We will have the sessions every time on, tu on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, so Tuesday, TD Science, and Thursday, Communication, Science Communication. This Thursday, we'll be focusing on challenges and solutions when it comes to science uh, dissemination. This is week two. Of course, all this information is included on the course website. Uh, week three, the, the, the dynamics will change a bit. The facilitators will be um, working in groups with the research teams to see how they're going regarding the concept notes that we will be sharing this week. And on Thursday, we'll be um, working according to, according to thematic groups and not teams so that we can, you know, meet each other and build our own community and, of course, share our experiences. These are the topics for week four. 
Week five. Week six. Uh, again, we'll have the small group sessions in order to see how the teams are doing. Week seven. This is a final uh, week in the course. And after this, you will be sitting a test so you can be awarded a certificate. Um, the ones that would like to go on to the next uh, stage or phase will start writing the concept note. Now I would like to briefly introduce our facilitators. We have been working on a weekly basis for months preparing this course. And each person that I will be introducing is assigned to work with three teams. They will be your contact point. Uh, and they will be helping you with any questions you might have during the course. You will be meeting with the facilitators in weeks four and six. This week, you will be uh, getting an email from your facilitator and they will be introducing themselves. I will stop sharing my screen now and ask the facilitators to introduce themselves. You have already met Cecilia Sorensen, so now I would like to give the floor to Carlos Barbosa. Carlos, go ahead. Well, good morning, everyone. It's quite surprising, uh, Carolina, how many people we have in the audience. I'm uh, a technician of geomatics with more than 25 years of experience in, in change, uh, environment and health. I work in the public ministry of health in Uruguay, and I'm here with this excellent group of committee members to continue sharing our experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Hilma? Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be part of this course, and I hope that we have a very successful experience together. I'm a doctor. I am also an epidemiologist, and I've been working on climate change and health for more than 18 years now. And I currently work as a professor of the National Institute in Colombia for Health. And I'm also part of the Global Consortium of Education and Health and Climate. And I'm also part of the Research Institute on Cl Social Climate in Colombia. So I'm, I'm very excited to be here and to be able to fulfill this purpose that we all have of how science can be translated into action and also not just in policy making but on applying these policies and on creating impact on the populations i think that's part of our purpose here and this is what we're going to be doing with this group of different teams from different countries all around the same goal. And welcome everybody, thank you. Thank you, Hilma and Irene. Hello, it's a pleasure. I'm Irene Torres. I'm an advisor of science and policy of the IAI. I have experience in research promotion of health at the in schools, in the communities, and in the certain components of the food system. I'm very interested in working with the different teams that I've been assigned. Thank you, Irene. Amber? Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Amwar Mendez. I'm a co-instructor of the Pan American Health Organization. I have a master's degree in public health from George Washington University, and my work revolves around climate change and health in the Americas. So I have a lot of experience working jointly with countries, and I'm part of the unit of climate change and environmental factors on health. I'm very pleased for this course to take place and to meet all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anwar. Laila? I think Laila is having issues with her microphone. Perhaps Maria Inez before uh, until Laila replies. Hello, welcome everybody. I'm very pleased to be able to participate in this course. I'm Maria Inés Carvajal. I'm an anthropologist in Argentina. My research topics and work are centered around human dimensions of climate change 
and the environment. And my research topic specifically is climate services and co-production of knowledge. So my objective for this course is to be a facilitator of including extra scientific members to the projects and to help in creating these links, which are sometimes very complex when it comes to decision-making on the environment, both the political components and the social components. So I'm very pleased and excited to start with this course and to be with all of you here. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Inés Matias. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I am Matias Mastrangelo. I am from the University of Mar del Plata in Argentina. I have a PhD in environmental studies and I am currently a fellow of the Inter-American Institute on research on climate change. My interest lies on the environmental change and its impact on the quality of life on human beings. And I'm here to support the process and to facilitate the teams. And I'm at your disposal for everything you need. Thank you, Matias. Laila? Can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Laila Sandroni. I'm an anthropologist and geographer with a PhD in social scientists. Um, I'm an expert in the transdisciplinary approach that I have been using in all my work in all those disciplines, in a work always related to global environmental change. And I hope that we can have a really, really productive course. I'm really proud and happy to be a part of this initiative. Gracias, Laila, y gracias a todos. Thank you, Laila, and thank you, everyone, all the facilitators. As you can see, we've created a group with diverse areas of expertise from different countries to support you along this process, and you'll be assigned for different groups, but we all serve all groups, so you can always request getting together with other members of the group in the event that you want to get some advice or you want to talk, discuss something specifically. I'm now going to continue with the presentation so that we can conclude on the details of the course. As I've already mentioned, in order to get the certificates, you have to be here to attend at least 70% of the sessions and also have a grade higher than 70% in the final exam that you'll take by the end of the course. For the TD groups, we've requested that you make sure that at least two members of the team uh, assist the groups, but all members are welcome to participate. The sessions will be recorded and will be uploaded on the website so that you can review the material both in English and Spanish. And every Monday you'll get an email with recommended readings both in English and in Spanish. And we've made efforts to find articles both in English and in Spanish, but we know that not everything is available in both languages. So don't worry if you cannot access 100% of this material because the final exam is related to the material that is actually presented during the sessions. For the participants who come from the different governments and who are not currently participating in the research teams, we encourage the groups that encompass the 26 groups to be committed with the uh, decision makers and policy makers that are part of this course. The idea is to gather the individuals with a team uh, so that you can find a common interest ground. It can be from the same country or from different regions, or they could simply be have a common theme or uh, similar interests. And we encourage individuals to get in touch with the leaders of the team so that they can uh, join the existing groups, because this is the only way in which you can proceed to the next stage which is the original workshop and the fund groups. We've shared with all of you a recording of the videos with the 26 teams and all the contact details are there. You can find the email addresses so that you can get directly in touch with the team leaders. Regarding Zoom, 
we ask you to please arrive on time for the beginning of the sessions. You can write your questions in the chat. And if we're not able to answer the questions live, we can always answer them by email and make sure that you keep your cameras on and your microphone off during the sessions. Well, having said this, I now give the floor to Matias Mastrangelo, who is the moderator of today's session. Matias? Thank you, Anna. Well, let's now begin with the first presentation of this course. For this, I'm going to start presenting the different speakers. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it perfectly. All right, so we're now going to present the different speakers. We have three speakers, Dr. Gabriela Alonso Chavez. She works at the University of Huerlo in the University of Calgary. And the focus of her work is learning and education in the framework of sustainability and global change. And in the past 10 years, she's participated in various research projects collaborating with different purposes, including capacity building from researchers and organizations in order to become part of networks that involve uh, knowledge holders, members of the civil society, in order to co-design and co-create knowledge geared towards solution seeking. Lily House Peters will also be one of the speakers. She is a, an associate professor of the California State University. Lily is an environmental geographist in policy and interested in environmental policy, uh, res natural resources extraction, governance, and policy conservation, and the role of technologies in the production of new ways of relating to nature. She has experience in uh, conducting TD research and she's conducted research all across the Americas. Marsha Lee Valentine will also be one of the speakers who is in the areas of agriculture and environmental sciences. She's a co-founder and vice chair of uh, Jamaican Women in Coffee. It's an organization responsible for development and the implementation of high social impact projects and community projects geared towards improving the lives of women across the value chain in coffee in Jamaica. She also operates a consultancy on food security and environmental man management. Her areas of expertise include knowledge transfer and technology and innovation, capacity city building and research based on communities. Well, having said this, let's now move on to the presentation in itself. I now give the floor to Lily, Gabby and Marshall Lee so that they can start with their presentation. Can you hear me? Sí, perfect. So I'm going to speak in, it, in Spanish because we have live interpretation into English. So first of all, to uh, greet all of you and to tell you how excited we are to be here. As Anna said, we've been spending weeks and months planning this. And we're quite enthusiastic because Lily and Marshall Lee, we are collaborators and good friends, which is an advantage of TD work. I wanted to quickly thank, especially those behind this, Laila, Haley, and Elena and Lourdes, who are in charge of interpretation, which is hard work. Uh, so I thank all of you. and. I'm now speaking from Calgary in Canada and from the Blackfoot Territory, which is one of the indigenous communities which is under a treaty 
from the British monarchy. So this is where I'm speaking from, and I invite you to reflect on the place where we are at and the indigenous communities that are ancestral owners of these territories. So let's now begin our first session, which is more introductory and more basic, with some uh, theoretical theory on transdisciplinary research. And as we've already heard, we have the chat available where you can write all your questions and we'll try to answer them as we go along. I'm going to speak more slowly for the interpreters. So as they've already mentioned, we're going to work on this session with Lily, Marshallie and myself uh, and following a few slides. Let's move on to the next one. It's important to mention that as we designed the program in itself, but specifically this session, we have these learning objectives, which are basically what we hope we'll achieve by the end of today's session. The first one is to define the uh, in transdisciplinary research approaches, including other forms of collaboration and to distinguish them. We are also very interested in establishing a link uh, and to have a critical review between uh, trans TD science, which is very much focused on the work that you undertake, and TD science. So, so translational and trans TD science. And the third, a question that we ask ourselves, usually when we work with teams, is why is this relevant to conduct TD work and not to trivialize uh, collaborate, uh, collaboration approach with other sectors, but rather to consider this as part of our work in itself. So in order to get there, one of the questions of why we're doing this needs to be asked. And this is the type of research geared towards making this public. Next slide. The focus areas, more general ones from these learning objectives, include an introduction to TD in the field of public health and to may establish these links between translational science in the field of research and present a concept that specifically for us is encouraging and motivates us to do this work, which is a new paradigm uh, a new way of working in uh, the field of uh, TD work, which is informed on uh, South epistemologies that we, Lily and I, we work in the in the global north, where which is known as a way of life. So this is closer to our hearts, and it's something that we wanted to share with you as a paradigm shift. And finally to understand TD approaches as a link that, of course, that is the million dollar question of the link that have a potential for opportunities to bridge science and policy. Next slide. So to start, Thank you, Ellie. But let's, uh, I'm now going to ask you to answer this uh, poll. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember the word in Spanish. Thank you, Soledad. It's uh, poll. Uh, we'll ask you to complete this. How familiar are you with TD research? How much do you know about this? Do you consider that you practice it often? Have you participated in a project that includes TD as a fundamental axis of your work? So we now give you a few minutes. One minute, Lily, okay. Mm-hmm. 
Muy bien. Entonces tenemos un buen grupo, una parte. Okay, so we have a large number of people who know a little moderate. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. So thank you very much. We can now close the poll. And let's continue. Because this, this, this type of information is important for us. So let's now move on to the next slide. Por algún motivo no está pasando de... For some reason, we're not able to move on to the next slide. We apologize. If you could share the screen yourselves, because it's, it's frozen. There we go. We have our savior. Gracias, Marshall. Okay, Marshall, thank you so much, Marshall. Okay, entonces, a esta era la que seguía. Bueno, este, para empezar, quisiera yo rápido contarles. First of all, I would like to tell you that yesterday I participated in a session coordinated by Mona Merckx, who is in charge of science in Canada. She's in charge of that kind of work. We participated in a science summit organized by the UN. And I thought it was very interesting to see that she, you know, really truly invited us to collaborate in, in science. And not just collaboration, but also this idea of, you know, um, having a conversation with the with a greater audience, especially after the pandemic. She was very clear about the need to have multilateral research with several countries, and also uh, doing work focusing on uh, collaboration. And this was great because we, uh, it, it was one day before this workshop, you know, and it also, um, of course, reflects the importance of our topic. You know, this was uh, uh, working collaboratively was cre uh, created over a decade ago in science, but clearly this is much more needed nowadays. First of all, what is transdiscipline? We tried to come up with a sentence that might illustrate this kind of concept. Transdiscipline is more than a new discipline or a super discipline. It's a different way to see the world. It's more uh, uh, systemic and holistic. So we like this quote because it, it, it's not just an intellectual or academic definition but rather it, it you know, includes other ways of looking at life, and these are other protocols. And this is key in TD science. Of course, we need scientific and academic knowledge, yes, but also other ways to see the world and other protocols that help us analyze social and natural phenomena. TD is a research uh, approach that focuses on integrating disciplinary fields, uh, uh, our main aim is to break away from uh, methodological uh, limitations. We are different disciplines. We might uh, belong to the same profession, but we have different ways of, you know, uh, doing research. And the idea is to, you know, uh, bring down these barriers and for the fields to uh, work together. We, TD also focuses on including non-academic stakeholders in the process of knowledge production. This, this seems easy, but it's not easy because it's a very complex topic. There are several uh, factors to consider, knowledge, legitimation, etc. 
So we need to consider how this uh, actually happens in practice. TDE uh, actually promotes participatory approaches when it comes to problem solving. And this needs to be applied to uh, tangible problems in the real world. In the suggested readings, we chose Natalia Tumas, Stockholm, and other people that describe this process. They say that TD and also uh, the interesting knowing how, t uh, how teams work is based on practice. So there is this connection between science and policy. Practice is what um, got researchers to think, well, I'm pr producing quite a lot of knowledge, but we actually need results in practice. So we know that part of our collaboration informs science, it describes biophysical processes, social phenomena, but it doesn't really um, uh, create public policies. And that's another one of the reasons why we need to work jointly with other sectors. Also, translational science was essential to, to study how teams worked. And also increased science uh, production, not just by a sole research, but by um, uh, teams, especially when it comes to um, large teams working together. And this is where the science of uh, team uh, science begins. Next, please. Thank you, Marshali. Um, Something else I would need to consider is uh, to distinguish TD from other research methodologies. We have, for instance, interdiscipline, which is a coordinated uh, collaboration that aims to integrate several disciplines. So uh, an example, for instance, I work in education, science education, and uh, your children, your grandchildren, at school, I'm sure they have uh, STEM subjects, right? These are new activities uh, that include, let's say, other activities that include these disciplines. So the idea is to implement aspects of all these disciplines. And that's an example of interdiscipline. Now, multidiscipline. This uh, addresses a problem from various perspectives and, and scientific disciplines. And this happens autonomously. The integration is autonomous. An example. Some multidisciplinary projects include a uh, focus on design. For instance, you have three disciplines, engineering, um, art, architects and they you know develop a project where the design is a main pillar that brings them all together so multidiscipline is different from interdiscipline number three convergence this is relatively recent i think it was created in uh, it came out in 2010 as one of the uh, 10 areas for critical funding in the united states this was done by the Science Council. Convergence aims to integrate knowledge that focus especially on technology, maths, and IT science. Some interesting examples. Of course, you can Google them. Um, but for instance, what fo everything that focuses on innovation and robotics, uh, for instance, um, prosthetics. I'm sure you're familiar with this type of um, surgeries and neuroscience and, you know, the possibility of mod modeling very advanced IET systems. This is considered convergence. And in this case, it's not just the integration of uh, professionals with different, that focus on different areas, but also different technological applications uh, regarding 
uh, inf information technology right. or information technologies. Next, please. Key objectives and characteristics of TD research. This is quite a long list, uh, but I would like to focus on just a few. Okay, you can have a look at the rest later on. A las slides. Entonces es el el trascender las perspectivas y enfoques específicos. So, going beyond uh, specific perspectives and approaches within a certain di discipline in order to address a common problem. We need a collaborative approach in order to uh, develop methodological issues. This is important because we need to have interdisciplinary integration throughout the research process. Generally, uh, Maybe it's difficult to integrate another discipline that is not included in the main team, but that is not the case here. Every stakeholder from the very beginning should work in this regard. Escuchamos, estás en mute. Oh, ahí. ¿Ya me oyen? Sí, perfecto. Okay. Yes, este... we can hear you now. Uh, also, we need to see what needs to be done in the project. Uh, transdiscipline, we always think about our topic and, you know, ecosystem services and what happens with uh, our TD work. And this is additional work. And also recreating uh, practical uh, uh, tasks and what should be done in the field. How long do I have left? Sí. Sí, estamos bien, estamos bien. Okay, 25 minutes, that's fine. Next, please. Thank you, Marshalee. Uh, the relevance of TD um, work. Well, TD is necessary. Why is it important? It's necessary when knowledge on a problem field is relevant uh, to society and it's uncertain as well. We know that this is just a definition, of course, and the global crisis, of course, makes us feel uncertain and we need to deal with the uncertain. When there is uncertainty, then it's when uh, we need TD work. Research, TD research can also, you know, um, reflect the complexity of problems. It's a model to understand and also provide solutions to complex um, problems. TD research includes the diversity of life and also the diversity of scientific solutions. It connects the abstract knowledge with uh, the practical side of things especially when it comes to the different types of protocols that stakeholders and uh, different sectors implement, and also develop knowledge that is perceived as a common good. And this is, you know, the importance of the common good or, or you know, uh, living well and this goes beyond the uh, academic side of things in, in it involves including other local perspectives the next one please thank you and finally this is one of the most exciting areas uh, that we have been addressing recently as a team it has to do with td as a way of life so we will be presenting two topics, let's say, and it will become clearer when we work with the case studies, uh, which is what Anna will be presenting. First of all, there is TD as a discipline, you know, the academic work of research that decide to explore this type of collaboration. The, 
this is the the theoretical basis for the discipline of course we have science sociology the theory of social ecology environmental psychology and more recently team uh, science and also when i say science the sociology of science this uh, uh, brings us back to a study uh, that focuses on the the main field and this is a main characteristic more recently this has been defined uh, tda has been defined as a way of life when transdisciplinarity is considered as a way of being it cannot be separated from you know your regular life and it goes beyond the professional activities of a researcher this is really exciting because we are you know rethinking our academic training and also which part of that training in a way limits our access to other types of learning communities this is informed by several uh, uh, so southern academics and i'm sure you know sandra diaz, diaz and you know this new way of you know addressing socio sociological problems also addressing the nature of people uh epistemologists from the south especially rivera kusikanki and other feminists uh from communities and something that is very important cognitive justice as described by odora hoppers from South Africa. This describes the need to, you know, validate the knowledge of those that have been left behind by academic and Europe, uh, Eurocentric knowledge. Thank you. I think that's, that's the last one. No? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going um, to give the floor to Lily. So now I'd like to give the floor to Lily. And thank you for your attention in these first slides. Um, bueno, muchas gracias, uh, Gabriela. Y... Thank you, Gabriela. So now we have another survey. And um, select up to two. Seleccione hasta dos respuestas aquí. So please select up to two choices and let's see how it goes. Okay. Um, hopefully you can see the, the responses to the poll and I'll go ahead uh, for right now and speak in English. So for those who are, are English speakers, um, otherwise there's dual translation in Spanish. Um, and we were, were curious with these polls, one, just to get to know the audience a little bit better. We're so excited to be here um, and to get to know the teams through this course. And two, it helps us to kind of understand better um, where everybody's focus is. Um, so actually, this is interesting because there's a great kind of, there's no one answer that's dominant. Um, and we see that there's actually a lot of focus on kind of all of these, but I do see disease transmission being public health, uh, water security and food security. Um, are kind of key concerns at this nexus of climate, environment, and public health. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, so here um, I'd like to draw attention to 
the uh, focus on implementation in translational science. And um, for those who are less familiar with transdisciplinarity as a research approach, um, you may be familiar from the medical field and from public health on translational science. Um, and so here we will discuss a little bit um, the focuses of translational science and then kind of bring us back to transdisciplinarity. So one point of entry. And here the focus is really on implementation and translational science and trying to see how we can implement the ideas and knowledge and discovery that are generated from medical research and kind of public health and, and disease focused research. And so one of the transformative processes here is to really think about how do we turn these observations, these sources of knowledge and data into interventions that actually improve health outcomes on the ground. So this process of kind of translation and transformation. And we're also very interested in this kind of the um, intersection of the translational science and public health and transdisciplinarity because there's this overlap in thinking about how do we promote interaction between both the producers and the users of research and knowledge. Um, and next week we're actually gonna speak quite a bit and I believe today's case study is going to begin to speak about um, how collaborative groups produce knowledge or create knowledge together. Um, but this is a major focus of transdisciplinary research, which is how do we um, increase the number of people and the types of people and become more inclusive um, to those who are part of the scientific process. So really thinking about that interaction between both the producers of the knowledge and then those who are going to use and implement this knowledge. And then a strong representation of stakeholders who are also very invested um, in, the health, in the health outcomes on the ground. So if you're familiar with translational science and public health, um, this is also kind of an entry point to begin thinking about uh, transdisciplinary science. And uh, next slide, Marcia, please. Um, and here we're thinking again about this process of translation and moving from um, what has sometimes been called the bench to bedside um, or from the laboratory kind of, you know, to the patient. And um, again, here we're really interested in this strong representation of stakeholders, um, those on the ground who are either implementing the science, receiving the science, um, or otherwise invested in improving the health outcomes. Um, and really thinking about how we can help kind of translate the research uh, knowledge that is coming out of the laboratory into more clinical um, and kind of uh, real world um, on the ground implementation. Also, we're interested in thinking about how we can bring into this picture um, more actors, such as policymakers who may be important, such as community leaders, um, patients themselves, um, and others who may be able to either create policy, make decisions, um, or empower people with this knowledge. And we're really interested, as Gabriella was speaking about, more holistic and comprehensive approaches to public health science, climate science, and environmental science. And of course, here are that really exciting nexus um, that this course is going to focus on. Um, and really also thinking about the usefulness of science, um, medical science, but also climate and um, environmental science, and how do we really make this um, science not just something that is in the pages of you know, uh, medical journals or in the clinic, but bring that out um, to more people and hopefully really kind of improve or increase, amplify, I guess, the impacts um, and the kind of social good that's happening. Okay, um, next slide, Marsha Lee. Okay, so this brings us then to thinking about transdisciplinary public health. And we see this as really kind of a transdisciplinary approach to translational science. And there's a really good text, uh, which we're drawing 
some of our references, especially um, the Stokel's reference from 2013. So there's a book called Transdisciplinary Public Health that was uh, published in 2013. It is in English, but um, for those who might be you know, interested, that's a good place as well to begin thinking about some of these processes. And so here we're really thinking about the actors involved and um, not just the academic, scientific and professional um, uh, people involved, which is many of us here today um, who are establishing these collaborations, but also bringing in other types of user groups and really thinking a lot about policymakers and decision makers um, through this lens of transdisciplinary science. And some of the benefits to this uh, transdisciplinary approach is it's been found to increase productivity um, and to kind of increase the impact of the research. Um, we're really interested in the dissemination and mobilization of the research results. And so that as well um, can be a benefit of transdisciplinarity. And importantly, producing really practical applications. So having both the high impact science, but also high impact um, you know, transformation on the ground and really thinking about what is going to be the application. How is this knowledge going to be picked up by people and utilized um, to make these changes? There's also some challenges to transdisciplinarity, like everything, the balance. Um, and so some of the challenges, and we'll continue to discuss these during the course, are really uh, transdisciplinary approaches can increase the amount of time and effort because you're now bringing in more diverse collaborators. You're now producing science that not only needs to be very high impact science, but you also need to think about how to communicate that science to diverse actors, how to implement that science, um, and how to kind of frame problems and frame solutions with diverse groups of um, invested stakeholders. Also, there can be conflicting demands and needs between different groups of actors, between the medical scientists, between actors on the ground, between your policymakers or decision makers. And so that's something that transdisciplinary research really focuses on trying to find common ground and trying to resolve conflicts um, in productive ways. And actually many creative kinds of solutions come from this, but it can be um, a challenge as you're getting used to kind of or thinking about a transdisciplinary approach. Um, also, sometimes there can be, you know, delays um, as teams need to kind of plan and collaborate and take into account diverse views and, and forms of knowledge. Next slide. I show you? Okay. So um, we're also very interested in the transdisciplinary arena for solutions oriented research and really thinking here about how science can address these very crucial emerging challenges at the CEH nexus or the nexus of climate, environment, and health which many of us are seeing, and especially the participants are seeing real time um, how urgent the problems are. Um, and so seeing how we can really you know, do a type of science that hopefully can produce transformative results. And <clears throat> we're also here in solution-oriented research, it aligns very well with uh, transdisciplinary approaches because we pay a lot of attention to who is included in the creation of knowledge, the production of knowledge, what types of knowledge are important and matter, how solutions get communicated and then implemented on the ground, because many of us have probably seen that there can be all of the best science in the world, but if those, um, that science isn't able to be effectively communicated, and um, translated into solutions that then can be implemented and that there is buy-in from stakeholders to implement those solutions and from policymakers and decision makers to implement those solutions, then the science will not have the impact that it needs to solve these urgent problems. And here we're also really interested in people's lived realities. Um, and that's part of diversifying the types of actors involved in the science because uh, research is finding it's really important to have a plurality of knowledge systems, 
and diverse knowledge holders involved in these processes. And that also helps then again with the implementation side. Um, also, we're really interested and in transdisciplinary approaches are really interested in addressing structural inequalities that exist, especially in knowledge production. So actors who generally haven't been part of the scientific process, uh, community groups that haven't been part of the scientific process, or decision makers and policy makers who maybe haven't been part of the scientific knowledge production process. Um, and this can help further diversify you know, the different kind of knowledge and epistemological foundations um, of our science, hopefully making that science more usable. Um, and really trying to think about how non-academic actors, and that's a big part of transdisciplinary research is bringing in um, these non-academic actors into the research field, um, what they you know, have to offer um, to improving the outcomes of this science. So that brings us next slide to the interface um, between science and policy. And there's a quote here that's from the uh, US Institute of Medicine and just really drawing attention to the importance of public policy, saying public policy can be one of the most effective approaches to protect and improve the health of the, po of the population. And so, here, um, we're really, and we'll be continuing to focus over the next few weeks on this science policy interface and its connection with transdisciplinary science. But here, we're really interested in the framework that transdisciplinary science can provide to researchers um, to help them collaborate more directly and more effectively with the people who are going to be doing the implementation, um, policymakers, uh, nonprofit organizations, NGOs, or other types of community mobilizers, um, as well as the actors who themselves are going to be affected by the types of policy decisions being made. Um, we see transdisciplinary science as really a science policy bridge. It's community centered and it's intervention oriented, uh, which we think is really imp important given kind of the urgency of the moment. Um, again, this uh, focus on kind of the composition of the research teams becoming um, more diverse, and this is unique, um, and trying to achieve more creative results by bringing together this different kind of diversity of knowledge systems, again, can lead to some challenges, um, which, which we'll also be focusing on how to overcome those in the most effective ways. And um, you know, law and policy is so important because it really is a place where there's a lot of power and it gives governments the power to manage public health um, by authorizing, organizing and empowering um, these agencies. So really thinking about how science uh, can speak to and inform law and policy in effective ways and how we can get buy-in from communities and decision makers um, to have the best outcomes. Uh, next slide. Okay, and um, we're coming into our final tienen, slides. Tienen 15 minutes. Ah, perfect. You have 15 minutes. Minutos. Tres, tres, okay. Three, Three minutes. minutes. Okay, so coming into our final, just concluding slides, and then we have a very quick uh, poll at the end. So here we're kind of reviewing and, and concluding. And on this slide, really thinking about how we can move from a more traditional distant approach um, to doing this kind of research where, you know, scientists are the ones, this is a more kind of distant approach, where scientists are, you know, testing solution options in clinics and very controlled environments where the interactions are really one-way interactions um, between actors and scientists to more engaging uh, approaches and inclusive approaches where solution options um, and experimental designs are created collaboratively, um, where the implementers and the affected stakeholders are really part of this process and where we can connect solution-oriented research, ideally also with local contextual knowledge, with indigenous knowledge and community knowledge, and that helps to broaden the spectrum of solution options and to understand which solutions are going to be accepted or more accepted than others. Um, next slide, Marshalee. 
And um, I won't go too much into this uh, given our time, but feel free to kind of review. We found this diagram kind of helpful for thinking about the differences distinguishing multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and transdisciplinarity across some of the defining characteristics. And so we see that transdisciplinarity is you know, more holistic um, than multi or interdisciplinarity. And just bring to our conclusion slide. So um, Marsha Lee. So in conclusion, you know, when is a transdisciplinary approach appropriate? What kinds of problems um, you know, need this type of approach? And here it's really the complex problems that integrate dimensions across social systems, ecological systems, and health or medical systems. Really, this nexus that is our focus here of climate, environment, and health. So we're discussing very complex um, or sometimes known as wicked problems. Also, multi-scalar problems that transcend from the global to the regional to sometimes the hyper-local scale, um, adding even more complexity there. Um, issues that have community impacts or request, require investment from community members for effective implementation. And here, climate, environment, and health solutions, when they get to that on the ground implementation, really require that type of investment. Otherwise, they can just kind of fail um, at the level where they impact society. And again, focusing on that lived reality where the local context, local knowledge um, are very important as well. And so we really see transdisciplinary science as you know, key or key mechanism to advancing these urgent climate, environment, and health um, nexus solutions. So just to finish here, we have one final poll. Um, so if you could take a minute, um, and this here is uh, asking, Again, you can select up to two, which actors um, are key collaborators in your opinion, and then we'll see the results. Thank you. All right, Haley, I think if we, okay, wow, okay, so very interesting. Um, here we see great focus on um, governments, ministers, uh, legislators, policy makers, which is excellent. That's actually the highest uh, category. Community members um, being the next, and then uh, health professionals is kind of the third. Um, so very interesting to kind of see where, um, where we're currently thinking, and we'll continue to have these polls as kind of quick ways uh, to, to kind of uh, get the pulse of the group. Um, and then we'll have more formal question and answer at the end. So at this point, thank you so much. And we're going to transition now to our case study with Dr. Anna Stewart. Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias, Gabriela, Lili, and Thank you, Gabriela, Lili, and Marshall Lee. Now, we're going to listen to the presentation of Dr. Ana Stewart Ibarras on the casework on the case study. She has a brief presentation as she's already introduced herself. She's a scientific researcher of the Inter-American Institute uh, for Global Change Research, and she's supporting the development and dissemination of science on environmental change for decision-making in the Americas. And she's an expert in climate and health in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, Anna, we're listening. Thank you, Matias, and Haley is going to share my presentation. Thank you, Haley. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. In the next half an hour, I'm going to share with you a case study of the TD research at the nexus between climate, the environment, and health. Next slide, please, Haley. Hoy voy 
Describir la experiencia de mi equipo. I'm to describe the experience of my team and the co-creation of a tool for early warning system on dengue in Barbados. I'm going to share one of the lessons, some of the lessons learned, and I'm going to share how this approach can be, is adopted in other countries in the Caribbean. I'm going to uh, say that this is the result of 10 years working on creating tools of early threat detection in Ecuador as well. Lastly, I will mention the opportunities and challenges that we're facing when making operative the different uh, climate uh, services in the regions. Next slide, please. I suspect that you probably know what the uh, um, airborne um, mosquitoes are, but mosquitoes are sensitive to temperature conditions because they can't control directly their body temperature. There's a possible transmission range for the virus possible. Uh, the virus of uh, dengue, Czechia, and chinguya it has a possible transmission between 18 to 34 degrees and an optimum transmission temperature of 26 to 29. You can see this on the graph. And you can also see the differences between the Aedes aegypti, which uh, can transmit diseases in warmer temperatures. The, the Aedes aegypti mosquito tends to lay eggs in recipients with standing water and we've seen that both rain, heavy rainfall and droughts can actually increase the, the reproduction of the um, mosquitoes. Rain can be accumulated in inside and outside houses, but droughts can also have the same effect uh, because people gather water around the house, especially in countries where there are water shortages and in neighborhoods where there is no uh, safe access to water. This means that the climate phenomena, which are extreme, such as droughts and extreme rainfall, can actually increase the mosquito habitats and increasing the transmission of this disease. If you're interested in knowing more about um, these diseases and born diseases, I advise you to check out the uh, study uh, that we shared at the beginning of the year. So how is climate change affecting vectors and the diseases? they bear. According to the IPCC reports for Latin America, climate change is affecting the epidemiology of infectious diseases sensitive to climate in the region. In some regions, uh, temperature increases in, increase the uh, transmission of vector-borne diseases, including um, certain diseases such as dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. Next slide, please. And how will climate change affect these diseases in the future? It is expected in the next decades, these endemic diseases will increase. This can happen because of the expansion of vector distribution, especially regarding uh, zoonotic viral infectious diseases in areas of transition between urban and suburban or rural areas on, on mountain sites, as we have seen in the Andes, for instance. Next slide, please. First Zoom question. Here you can see the question in English, if you prefer to read English, and it's also in Spanish. The options are the same. You have one minute. Um, how is climate change affecting dengue fever transmission? Has everyone voted? So the right, uh, the right answers were A and C. Uh, you know, 
the frequency of these events can increase the habitat for mosquito vectors and also warming temperatures up to an optimal temperature range uh, can increase the suitability for disease transmission up to 26 uh, uh, degrees. Next slide, please. Entonces, ¿cómo podemos utilizar la so how can we use climate information to better manage these public health threats? Climate services are being developed for many sectors under the Global Framework for Climate Services. Climate services take climate information and transform it into a useful product for a specific sector, such as the health sector. Next, please. The Global Framework for Climate Services identifies four areas of action to develop these tools. First, we need to engage with climate and health sectors and other key stakeholders, creating trusting partnerships and uh, uh, improved communication. Second, we need to generate the scientific evidence uh, of how climate is impacting health outcomes and evidence of how adaptation measures like EWSs can reduce the burden of disease and economic costs. Third, we need to build the capacity of health and other sectors to access, understand, and use climate and weather information, and also meteorological information. Finally, we need to implement tools that use climate information so that this becomes part of the day-to-day decision-making in the health sector. Next, please. This is an example of the data inputs and outputs for a vector-borne disease early warning system. On the left, you can see the inputs, including disease and vector surveillance data, spatial information, climate, and weather data, and meteorological data as well. On the right, you can see the different modeling tools that can be used to bring these data streams together in a predictive framework. And towards the lower right, you can see the climate service or decision support that comes out of this process, such as an interactive map or report. Next, slide. Next please. If you would like to learn more about modeling tools uh, regarding climate sensitive diseases, last year we completed a project with the Wellcome Trust where we analyzed every modeling tool currently available for climate sensitive infectious diseases. You can explore the report and website and learn more about each of the 37 tools and also uh, other outputs or results of the analysis. Next, please. Sorry, next Zoom question. To develop climate services for the health sector, you need to, and you have five options. Estamos esperando que se cierre el Zoom poll. So we're yeah. waiting for people to answer the Zoom poll. Uh, now we'll get the results automatically. Excellent. Most of you have identified that everything that has been mentioned, uh, everything mentioned above is necessary to develop climate services. Uh, now I, I will uh, talk about the Barbados experience. In the next slide, I will share examples from an ongoing collaboration in Barbados. Uh, Barbados is a small developing island country in the east of the Caribbean. In 2017, the Ministry of Health and Wellness of Barbados began working with a team of practitioners and researchers, including myself, to co-create a dengue early warning system. They had identified viral diseases as, as a major um, public health problem. Uh, Zika had expanded throughout the region, Chikungunya a few years before, and also dengue outbreaks were on the increase. They knew also that uh, 
changing weather conditions were increasing the risk of uh, outbreaks as well. And as this is a small city with an economy that is based on tourism, they noticed the, the urgent need to have tools to better manage disease outbreaks and to prevent diseases and, and di diseased people. This collaboration began with uh, a project uh, coordinated by the Meteorology Service, th service through a uh, uh, capacity institution in the Caribbean. Also, the Red Cross uh, service has helped us. Also, the Public Health Agency in the Caribbean, also a new project from the Welcome Trust. Next, please. Uh, we, uh, our team includes Mrs. Leslie Rollock, also Sabu Betz from the Meteorological Services from Barbados, Dr. Laura Lee Grunum from the Public Health Agency in the Caribbean, uh, Dr. Shay Mahon, uh, Cedric Balmwemi, and Rachel Lowe. They are in researchers with experience in modeling, entomology, geography, governance, ecology, and social science. Here, uh, I have shared an article that describes this collaboration process. Next, please. Our team has focused on qualitative and quantitative methods to co-create uh, models collaboratively. We have discussed the needs of the health and climate sector, the current capacities of the sectors and potential solutions. We created a prototype model and we presented it to the team. Through this process, a model was improved. And thanks to this transdisciplinary co-design process, the idea is to have a more relevant, uh, credible and legitimate tool. And also the tool will be useful to inform decision-making in public health. Next, please. During the qualitative research stage, one of the first steps was identifying key institutions and partners. The team identified a network of agencies and funders engaged in climate uh, virus surveillance and control. Organizations in black were identified as current partners and organizations in red were partners that needed to be strengthened uh, with the health sector. Actually, they were not actively participating uh, with the health sector. Notably, the team indicated that no formal collaborations existed between the national climate and health sectors, and this was identified as a potential barrier to the implementation of a dengue early warning tool. Next, please. The team identified a number of key strategies to strengthen intersectoral climate health partnerships and to raise climate impacts on the national health agenda, as you can see here. Here you can see uh, the recommendations made. A partner talked about the need to strengthen the cooperation among sectors. Also, we need to work with people from the each sector. We need to understand them to know uh, what their needs are, what motivates them, why, because maybe they need some, we might think that they need something, but they don't. So we need to forget about um, ourselves and we need to, you know, feel what other people feel in order to, to find out their needs. That's true involvement. Next, please. The team also learned about existing capacities that could be lever, lever, leveraged and capacities that needed to be strengthened to implement a dengue early warning system. This information was collected through surveys with the public health, uh, with uh, stakeholders from the public health sector. And they uh, told us that they needed, that there were different gaps and in, they also had training needs in order to interpret and organize basic climate information and also how they could integrate this information in the surveillance and planning activities. They also identified a lack of sustained funding as a potential barrier to the implementation of a dengue early warning system. Next, please. 
Uh, we also developed an inventory of epidemiological, climate, entomological, uh, and geographic data. This was information about the current surveillance systems in order to better understand the data that existed at the time and how we could work with that information in order to build a model that could be sustainable in an early warning system. Once we received the data, we worked jointly with the team to explore the information and to improve our understanding of the uh, disease transmission dynamics when it comes to space and time. Next, please. We successfully developed a dengue forecast model that used climate information to predict the risk of dengue outbreaks three months in advance. This experience uh, showed us that excess rain and droughts could increase the risk of dengue outbreaks at different time frames. Water conditions increased the likelihood of a dengue outbreak up to two months later, likely due to the accumulation of rainwater. Surprisingly, drought conditions also increased the likelihood of a dengue outbreak three or five months later, likely due to water storage in uncovered containers around their home during times of water scarcity. In water scarce countries like Barbados, household water storage has been promoted as a climate change adaptation strategy. This finding taught the team about the need to collaborate with urban planners and other stakeholders uh, involved with building ordinances that regulate water storage around homes. Next slide. Next, please. These, our team is now working to find solutions to host the early warning tool online and ensure its sustainability. One promising approach is to use a climate services online platform that is currently hosted by the Barbados Meteorological Services on their website. These services issue warnings on a range of meteorological hazards that have health implications. The team is exploring ways to translate probabilistic outbreak forecasts into impact level alerts using decision matrices. This would allow the alert message to combine the level of certainty in the forecast with urgency for action, similar to other impact-based forecasting tools hosted by the Barbados Meteorological Service. As you can see here on the screen, this is the, the, the current platform that they use to uh, predict uh, this kind of fog. And also, it also includes some recommendations. We're also working to co-design this early warning system uh, for dengue in other countries in the region, together with the um, uh, Caribbean uh, health authorities. Next, please. One of the success stories of this result is that the results were included in the 2020 edition of the uh, climate and health balloting of the Caribbean. Here we, the climate, um, the health sector is warned about uh, the drought and also in the case of excessive rains, especially in the east of the Caribbean. This health, uh, this Caribbean health climatic balloting that you can see on the screen is an excellent an example of a climate uh, model that is co-produced uh, for the health sector regionally. Since 2018, climate and health experts meet every quarter to analyze climate forecasts, and they also make statements about the impact on several health systems. This balloting is then sent to the Ministry of Health of the region. In future, the qualitative in Estimations of dengue risk may also be included in national ballotings or in regional ballotings or other platforms that may uh, support decision making in the health sector. Next, please. El proceso de desarrollo de la herramienta de alerta the process of developing the dengue early warning system showed us a number of challenges and opportunities. First, we need to address the institutional context that can and governance context that can facilitate or limit the implementation of a climate tool in the health sector. This includes the willingness and ability of institutions to engage in cross-sectoral work 
and to share data, especially sensitive health data. This also includes an assessment of the pat partners who should be at the table and the ones we are missing and the ones we should uh, promote uh, connections with. This is based on solid high trust cooperation that is you know, forged over time. Regarding climate and health data, there is an opportunity to create and strengthen integrated climate health surveillance systems and observatories, uh, integrated climate and health data, and also to develop um, harmonization and data exchange protocols. A focus model is only as good as the data that goes into it. In some cases, Earth observations can be used, satellite observations can be used to fill data gaps. Finally, there is an opportunity to create and sustain a cohort of climate health practitioners across the region and also researchers working in the area in the interface of climate, environmental health in the region. And also, we can create a number of tools that are useful for the healthcare system. And this is why we're here today. Uh, climate and health professionals need to be joint, jointly trained in order to increase local capacities and to create a community of practice. There is also a need to create support career paths at the climate health interface. Final Zoom question. Which of the next methods was not used by the Barbados team? You have one minute to answer the poll. And with this, we're going to conclude this part of the presentation. Okay. Bueno, hubo diversa respuesta, pero okay, so we had a diversity in answers, but the uh, question with the most answers is not doing the entomological studies in the field. Based on the previous work that we conducted in Ecuador, this type of study were conducted in order to better understand what is happening at a small scale. But in this case, we've worked more at national level with a database that is uh, that already exists with the sector climate, the health climate, to use the existing data and using uh, methodologies of social sciences to include more stakeholders, having meetings and joining the moderation and collaboration team. Next slide. So with this, I'm going to now conclude, and I thank you for your attention. I thank you for all your questions, and I welcome you to this course and this community. You can read further on the collaboration process to develop an early warning system in the applications that you see here on the slide, and I hope I will be able to answer all your questions. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. The case study is very interesting. We're now going to devote the next 15 minutes to answering the questions that were shared here in the chat. I'm going to ask the questions to the speakers and I ask you to be brief when answering these questions. The first question that was asked is actually a request on reflecting on which have been the main lessons learned. And the main recommendations on these reflections. 
Matthias, I think that question was more for the TD group, wasn't it? Lili, Gabriela. I didn't get the question. I'll repeat the question then. We're asked to reflect on the lessons learned and the main recommendations to manage TD research in practice. All right, so let's start sharing the lessons learned in the, we're going to share them in the upcoming sessions. There was one on clarifying convergence between transdisciplinarity and, yes, but Gabriela, the question was whether you could share on some ideas on lessons learned or best practices based on your experience that of course we'll be discussing in the upcoming sessions and throughout the course, but perhaps you already have a few ideas that you could share on good practices, lessons learned. Yes, so something, that's something I was uh, thinking of when I was listening to your case study. Perhaps we could have this idea of having transdisciplinarity is not something that's static. We, we don't say we're just doing TD research. It's a dynamic process and it depends on the project that you're involved in. So there was a question here, Anna, on the participation of communities. And there are instances during research where you integrate or you include other sectors. That's what transdisciplinarity is all about. So in our case, We've had experiences of integrating the key stakeholders from the uh, beginning of the research, and that makes a, a huge difference when regarding differences between a proposal for research and its uh, finance, uh, financial components and the results. So this could be a lesson learned that the work with a stakeholder that can be a policymaker and indigenous community determines the research research question and not the other way around. And sometimes in academia, we encourage the idea of having an innovative question uh, to apply for a grant. And that can, of course, limit your access to a co-creation of a research project. I don't know if this could be a lesson that was learned. Yes, undoubtedly, for sure. Thank you, Gabby, for your answer. Lily, would you like to perhaps add something else to Gabby's question, or perhaps we can move on to another question? Um, for the sake of time, maybe we could move on and then we can we can come back if you know we're thinking about things, but just so that we can hear a variety of, of questions. Muy bien, gracias. gracias. Bueno, ahora sí, eh, la pregunta que All right, me... thank you. Now, the question that uh, Gabriela was mentioning regarding the overlap between convergence uh, and dis transdiscipline, we're asked to clarify on the difference between these two concepts. Uh, well, Lili, uh, Lili empezó a... Uh, well, Lily started explaining here in the chat, perhaps something that's useful to know is that convergence refers mainly to cross-pollinization of disciplines, specifically on technology, IT science, math, and convergence is method methodological cross-pollinization. So the approach is for a specific phenomenon, unlike transdisciplinarity, which tends to attend uh, to societal problem. And the other difference is something important is that these are models to understanding collaboration. So those who study this present models and they describe them so that they can undertake initiatives in terms of science. So. Uh, and C, describe convergence uh, with a focus on collaborations that have a social impact because they create 
um, research uh, in the moon between uh, anthropologists and engineers. So explanations are derived such as cognitive or uh, methodologies or analogies. So this is a way of analyzing collaboration, but transdisciplinarity, two key components include members of the civil society. So they include groups and communities that are not part of the academia necessarily. That is the official definition. And the other characteristic is that they uh, address social problems such as climate change, adaptation to climate change. I hope that this was uh, helpful in clarifying it. Oh, and something else, uh, something that's also relevant uh, aside from participation, transdisciplinarity emerges as a way of understanding collaboration pro problems because there can be collaboration without consent or consensus. So this could be a step further and Maria Patricia Cuervo and Ana Lucia mentioned the participatory actions and useful tools. Thank you. Um, also, thank I you, just, Gabriela. Uh, very quickly, I just wanted to mention um, in the chat, the Equipo Cuba um, just put a, a really good comment about another lesson learned, I believe, from their team, which um, I think is another key key type of lesson when doing transdisciplinary research is this idea of establishing, well, learning together. So there's a lot of kind of joint work in this type of collaboration. And a lot of that is learning together um, in order to establish a common language, because as we'll see, or as we're off, off, probably seeing here in this group of about 125 people with different backgrounds, if you're a policymaker or a social scientist, um, or a medical scientist or quantitative or qualitative, these different disciplines give us different ways of um, methodologically understanding what is data, what is research, but also just different languages and viewpoints through which we see the world. And so this idea of needing to find a common working language with a team, and actually next week, we're gonna speak about boundary objects and some of this work of integration um, in this type of transdisciplinary teamwork. But I just wanted to bring people's attention because I think the Equipo Cuba made a really nice comment um, there in the chat responding. So, gracias, Cuba. Gracias, Lili. Una última pregunta. Sobre... Thank you, Lili. And we have uh, one more question on the a transdisciplinary session, we are asked between the relationship between translational science and transdiscipline. This question is geared towards understanding the difference between these two concepts. And the question also is whether participatory action could be understood as transdisciplinarity or as translational science. And what would your opinion be on this? Perhaps we could first uh, make, the, make the difference between these two concepts and its relationship between a participatory action. Sure. So um, I think this goes a little bit to part of Gabriella's part of the presentation and thinking about transdisciplinarity as a discipline, but also as actually kind of a way of life or a way of seeing the world. So I would say that translational medicine, um, where we saw the overlap there was with this focus on implementation, with this focus on trying to um, bring in diverse kind of actors to the process of really translating what is found in the clinic and the medical kind of uh, research part to on the ground kind of solution. So we really liked from translational medicine, the implementation focus, the solutions oriented focus. With transdisciplinarity, I would argue um, from my perspective that transdisciplinarity goes kind of beyond translational medicine because transdisciplinarity requires really from the beginning that you are kind of co-creating research with diverse actors. So this goes all the way back to framing the problem, right? What is the problem? Rather than showing up as scientists to say, we know the problem, it is X. Um, now we'd like to, you know, bring you into doing some methods or interview you. 
we really believe that transdisciplinary science in its truest form, and it's, it's difficult, um, it can be difficult to do, brings those actors in at the beginning of the process to um, collaboratively form the research problem and then kind of move through the steps of research. So it's really an integration um, of those actors into the research process um, rather than just in the kind of later implementation phases. So that might be one difference um, regarding transdisciplinary and translational. And I'm not an expert in participatory action research, so if somebody else wants to come in, but um, I also see participatory action research as perhaps a tool that would be useful in transdisciplinary research, but transdisciplinary research as being kind of a larger umbrella. Um, so that would be, I don't know, Gabriella or Marshall Lee, if you see it differently, or um, Anna, if you want to speak from the case study, um, I'll stop there. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you, Lily, and it's a, a conversation that's ongoing, right? Like maybe in the, you know, we, we make a distinction between the discipline of TD and the way of life, in the discipline of TD, translational science. Oh, perdón, estoy hablando en inglés, ¿verdad? <laughs> Apologies, I'm speaking in, in English, but uh, translation, tra translational science is the departure point for trans TD science. This is what Lily is explaining from the, the clinic and the lab to the people. So this is a good example because there's an unbreakable bridge between knowledge and we can't say that the doctor has knowledge that the patient does not, but translational science propelled, drove the, the debate between the users and doctors themselves. So I agree with you in that uh, participatory action, ethnographic work, as I said in the chat, we are communities that uh, of learning, of providing answers, and we work with uh, boundary objects. And these are all tools that will help us develop a transdisciplinary approach and work within a research project. Thank you, Gabriela. We're now going to devote some minutes to answering other questions related to the case study that are directed to Anna. They are asking what is the role of communities in the different stages of the case study in Barbados? What were the lessons that were learned from the uh, warning system? And what has been the it's, it's sustainability over time? Oh, these are good questions. These initiatives was uh, brought by a demand of the sector uh, of uh, public health and agencies on the climate. So as a researcher, it was a very interesting moment for me to be able to contribute with research, but identified as a top priority and a need. And in this case, we responded to this interest or this demand and the uh, financial component was given from the stakeholders themselves and we worked at national level. We worked directly with the person in charge of epidemiology in the country and their team with, along with labs and the meteor meteorological service and regional agencies. And we started working in two countries, not just in Barbados, but also the Dominican Republic. And in these studies, we focused on the participation with government stakeholders. We, we didn't work directly with the communities at this stage. As I said, it was a process that was oriented by the national stakeholders from these countries. So that's answering the first question. The second part about the lessons learned and its sustainability, that's a good question. We are still in the stage of being able to see how we will implement this model. And as I was saying in my presentation, we're working on the possibility of uh, adapting this for the meteorological service. So this is a lesson learned to see the existing resources, the existing platforms and how they can be used instead of thinking that we can come up with something new or develop another tool. Uh, it's possible to do this, but it's good that we start by knowing what is already available and how we can work along these lines to make it more practical. 
and also thinking of other lessons learned, the importance of creating a simple model, as simple as possible, that does not uh, include an uh, uh, ongoing flux of information. We developed a model that does not require a constant influx of data, and that has an input with uh, stational weather data reports, and it's updated once a year with new epidemiological data so that we can adjust the different parameters for the model. So this prevents this from being too heavy for the uh, implementation from the public sector. If we, uh, it's, it's impossible to uh, maintain this over time by having people submitting this. Just think of the statistics of the math uh, algorithms. We need to develop useful and simple tools over time that do not require uh, great investment over time. And the other thing is the innovation that came up because working with existing platforms and developing a model was the result of the uh, discussions between the transdisciplinary teams where we gathered all the uh, uh, academic uh, stakeholders. They contributed with their uh, inputs and that was a source of innovation and creativity. So that was a key point. And I'm going to repeat myself once again that trust is important. We need to create rapport. It all boils down to human interaction. We're not robots, we're not machines, we are human beings. And all the transdisciplinary work is based on equal relationships, relationships based on trust, where there is a commitment for developing work over time. And so if you can, uh, some of the main takeaways for today is how we can uh, have a more equitable report and in future sessions we'll focus more on inclusion justice and equality that includes uh, important components of the td approach well thank you anna i think that this uh, your final comment is a good way of concluding this uh, session for today all the questions that we did not have the time to answer live. We'll send your answers by email with so that we can continue with our interaction. I don't know, Anna, if you want to say anything else. So we're now concluding with the first session. I thank all of you for being here and we'll see you all on Thursday. You can check out the recordings and you can also read the articles that the different speakers have shared with you. And in case you have any comments or questions, we are here. Uh, the leaders of the teams, team leaders will uh, know what your facilitators will be, who will be joining you in your teams. And we're going to be sharing more information on the conceptual notes that you'll be drafting towards the end of the course for those who want to continue to the second stage. So we'll stay in touch. Thank you so much for today's session. I hope you have a nice day.